Hi. Um, today I'm going to introduce Elixir. Elixir is a functional programming language. Um, it's functional, dynamic, and garbage collected. Um, before I get too much, before I dive into Elixir, straight to Elixir, I like to talk about functional programming languages in general. So, what is a functional programming language? So, I see programming languages as a way to write instructions to a computer that it can understand so it can tell it what to do. In a functional programming language, we use functions which we got from math, which are just kind of these things that take an input and give us an output. And in functional programming languages, that's our main construct, functions. Um, we probably want some context with this, so I kind of have an image here, comparison of like procedural languages, which kind of just have this code that operates on data. Object-oriented languages like um, Java, Ruby, we have an encapsulation of data and code, so our code operates on the data. And in a, f in a pure functional language, we just have code, and the data passes through the, the code. So it passes through our functions. And this is a sort of a um, kind of a joke slide. Um, it's um, uh, in, f in a functional programming language, we just have a function, so it's kind of like simpler. So we don't have all these uh, design patterns. It's so I mean, it's just to say you know, it's we deal with functions. We don't have mutable states. We don't have other things. So yeah. And you might be wondering why functional at all. So. Uh, thing about, uh, uh, thing about uh, functions is, if you, I mean, if you have a pure function, it just takes an input and it'll give an output. And given the same input, we'll always get the same output. So they're, they're predictable. And predictable means also they're easier to test and immutable, immutable data. Um, and immutable data means easier concurrency. Because if, if your data doesn't change, then it doesn't really matter what order your threads are trying to access them in. So it makes it actually it really does make it simpler to program for a, like, concurrent programs. Um, so why Elixir out of all the programming languages? So Elixir is, I mean, the main thing is it's functional, right? It has a Ruby syntax, so it's developer friendly. It's garbage collected, which not necessarily a plus, but um, I mean, I don't like to manual you know, manage ma memory manually. Maybe you don't either, so it's plus. Um, it's dynamic, so you don't have to type out things, so it's more, you have more freedom, which I like. Um, it has a pretty nice growing community. A lot of Ruby developers are getting into it, so it, it's good. It has a nice ecosystem. You have like Mix, which is like NPM on steroids. You have Xtest, which is a built-in testing framework we get with Elixir. You have Phoenix, which is a great web framework, and you have Erlang libraries. and the Erlang VM, which I'll talk about right now. So Erlang was a functional programming language, functional programming language invented by Ericsson, a telecoms company. Invented it in Erlang was invented in the 1980s um, by Ericsson, and it, as you can imagine, um, a telecoms company. You have at that time they had phone switches, and you had lots of people that needed to be talking at the same time, and you don't want to cut them off. So what? Ericsson needed was a language that was highly concurrent, um, distributed, um, always available, and fault tolerant. And they also wanted hot code swapping, which is while, co while the system's running, you could swap code in without interrupting it. And it was, it's reported that uh, Erlang has availability of 99, so 99.9999999999%, which I, I think I, I read something like it's like, like less, like 0 0.6 seconds within 20 years, something like that. I mean, it could be a little bit, it might not be exact number, but something like that, which is pretty incredible. Um, some companies that have used Erlang are like um, AW, I mean, a Amazon, w WhatsApp, Line, RabbitMQ, CouchDB, T-Mobile, Facebook. Um, these are some other numbers, like Yahoo, for 50 million users, to Facebook, 100 million, T-Mobile, SMS, Ericsson. WhatsApp was a pretty famous example. They have in, like incredible like 19 billion messages in, 40 billion out. A small team, 10 people on Erlang. Um, it's pretty amazing um, what Erlang is capable of. And and um, just uh, almost done with the Erlang part of here. Um, uh, Erlang's concurrency model is based on something called the actor model, and actors are processes. Everything in Erlang is processes and. This is kind of misleading because you have operating system processes and Erlang processes, which is actually implemented as threads. But um, for, for the purposes of here, like um, uh, Erlang process is 
a kind of like a thread that's managed by the Erlang VM. And here, um, actor is like a process that has like a own mailbox. So it could communicate with other actors through the mailbox. So it sends messages asynchronously. And an actor could spawn other actors. It, it has an, a hierarchy. And I believe, yeah, um, that's, 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 the actor, that's the concurrency model for Erlang, which is like for like pro languages like Java, it's, it's um, like it's, you manage threads yourself. Man and for languages like JavaScript, which is single thread, you have an event queue. So this, this, this is some comparison. And an uh, interesting philosophy for Erlang is the let it crash, which I kind of see like Erlang, you know, kind of seeing like the processes as like the bumper cars. Like, you know, like who cares? I'll just pick you, pick you up and then put you back there. Put you back, you know, like restart you. And um, in Erlang, you have like supervisors and workers, and workers actually do the, the work of computation. And supervisors kind of like manage the workers, so they see if, if a, a worker kind of crashed, it will restart it. And supervisors will have supervisors. So this is kind of their, their, the fault tolerant part. Like a program, if it starts having parts, processes that crash, it will restart itself, which is pretty, pretty cool. And where does Elixir come in all this? Um, Elixir is compiled down to Erlang abstract format, which is, and another name for, um, I forgot what it's, exactly what it stood for, Beam, but that's the uh, Erlang virtual machine. So bo uh, both Elixir comes down, you know, uses the Erlang VM, which is why it has this powerful uh, model. Um, so now to Elixir syntax. So um, we have, in Elixir you have atoms, which are kind of like Ruby symbols, which you could just think about as string constants. And they're just kind of like when you need to represent a value with a thing that is that value. And they have super fast comparisons. JavaScript, you know, ES6 also has symbols, but um, yeah. We have tuples, which are like a set of related items. So uh, pretty commonly you'll have like, if you like, this is like Elixir code where you do like file.read file, and you'll get back a tuple where you have one is like okay. The first you know, item could represent status, which is like either OK or error. And the second one could be like you know, error message or the contents. And tuples are stored contiguously in memory. So I guess it's like, like an ar ar array. Uh, maps are your key value stores. Um, and this is, um, is kind of like, like the object literals, except you don't have object. It's just pure data. And they're related to another thing called struct. Structs are also maps in Elixir. And um, except structs, you have some, you set a default value from the head on. Well, maps, you can kind of add properties to it and stuff. Well, um, keyword lists are a list of a, um, what was it? A list, it's a list, oh, I'm sorry. yikes, um, just a minute. A keyword list is a list of tuples of two element tuples where each, where the first uh, element in each tuple is a atom. And the, th thing, uh, the, the unique thing about keyword list are the keys may not be unique. And they're usually used for like, you know, like if you use like Phoenix the web framework, or, uh, or actually if you're using Ecto, which is the database wrapper for uh, Elixir, you could kind of have a aware clause so you have like multiple like you know like where name is bar where na where name where age is 16 so you can kind of have like multiple clauses that you could use um, pattern matching is a pretty powerful feature of functional programming languages and it's in elixir which is um, you see equal signs constantly but they're not actually assignment operators they're, they kind of see the structure so you kind of think about it like an, like a like an equation almost. Like you have to have both sides to have the same pattern or structure. And you could, we've used this in JavaScript when we destructure, which is, it's pretty similar syntax. And you could kind of like, you know, you could um, get certain elements from a list. And you could, you could uh, put them in variables. Now the actual functions, um, functions you'll define by def. And this is how a function would look like. You have pipe operators, which are pretty cool. You could like feed data results of functions into another. So you could like write, write all your um, pipe data th throughout through your functions. Um, you have enums, um, which is like it's, it's a mo it's a built-in Elixir library, which gives you like functions that you could 
use, like reduce, map, um, there's a lot of them. Uh, a list comprehension is just syntax, syntactical sugar over um, the, en the enum. You could um, do, you could like, this is kind of like how you would loop through a, um, loop through data in Elixir, except you don't actually loop through it. But, and you could compose this. And I'll probably show this in some code at the end. Um, Elixir is tail call, opt tail call optimized. So tail recursion is when you have a recursive function where the last thing you do is a recursive call. And um, the, us the usual signature for tail recursion is when you have uh, another parameter or that where you're feeding data into it. And if you have tail, tail call, if your compiler is tail call optimized, you could uh, jump to other, a function and then back again without allocating additional memory. So this, and Elixir has this, so this means um, you, don't have, you don't have to create additional stack frames for recursive calls. Um, mix is like uh, what I mentioned before, is, a, is your NPM on steroids. You could kind of like just write mix new example and you get all these files, which is, which is very nice. Um, and it, you, know, use, you also uh, use it to manage dependencies. You have like a package.json file and yeah. Um, documentation in Elixir is a first class citizens, which means you have like methods to generate and access your documentation. So I did not create this HTML file. I just kind of, I just kind of um, like uh, ha added a little bit of like commenting in my code and I do like mixed docs and I get all this documentation, which is amazing. Um, testing is, you know, I, um, testing is usually seen as a, is a real pain. Um, but Elixir test, you know, Elixir comes with built-in test, test framework. And in here, we, you can see test is pretty easy, actually. You write, you write, you have a test, you have a do, which is, you know, kind of like a, like, define like a function, and you have asserts and refutes. And this makes it pretty simple to test. So when you use Elixir, what you really get is you get the nice uh, developer-friendly Elixir syntax. You get the power of Il um, Beam, which is Erlang um, VM. You have you can use Erlang libraries because it all gets compiled down to Erlang abstract format. You have Mix, which is a powerful build tool. You have a, a built-in test framework, first-class documentation, and um, Talk is cheap. So um, I guess I'll show a quick Elixir program. Um, oops, this is not Elixir program. Mm. Uh, can't. F um, I guess we're just going to call the end of this. Oh, actually, no, I see it. All right. So mix.exs is kind of like your um, package.json file. You kind of define your dependencies here. And your cards, th this is um, a small Elixir program I wrote. So like, it's, you could cr like this is a, a function for creating a deck of cards. And here, like um, where you would normally have to do like a double, you know, a nested for loop, the way to, to do it in Elixir, you have like this uh, list comprehension and it's composable, which is why this is, which is a very functional approach. You'll see like you could pass, you have your suit and for each uh, value, um, you'll get a suit. Um, and I have a shuffle function which will shuffle. And this is kind of how uh, Elixir will look like. And if at the end of this function, I'll have a cards that create deck where I will create a deck, um, feed, feed the deck of cards into the cards.shuffle uh, function. And I'll then feed it to the cards.deal which will deal the hand. And to see what the uh, documentation will look like, um, the documentation I wrote for this file is you can see like I wrote at doc and I return a list of strings or, or module doc. If I just go to this index.html uh, file which was generated by, um, by Elixir, I have documentation. So I have cards and I have, I have uh, you could see the function names, contains um, examples. I could even write code examples and yeah. And tests are, you can imagine, is, is, it's very simple. Um, you, I mean, to run the tests, 
You don't have to install anything to run your tests. You don't have to install an expectation library. And that's my presentation for Elixir.